driving down the left-hand side of the box is Rico. Rico's cross in towards Dominic Solanke with a header, and it's 2-2. Dom Solanke on the score sheet, wins a penalty, and now scores a goal. Rico immediately with the impact, excellent cross from the left-hand side, and Solanke, despite the goalkeeper's hand, finds the bottom right corner, and the Joes with almost half an hour to play, back on terms at 2 inch. Hello and welcome to episode 105 of Back of the Net, the AFC Bournemouth podcast. My name is Sam Davis and this is the last of the live lockdown pods that we're doing. From next week, we're back to the latest of the new normals and for Bournemouth Pool and Christchurch, we'll be entering tier two. So whilst you'll be able to get back to the pub and sink a few pints, you'll need to have some pie and mash with it. Understood? Is there any logic? Probably not. But the good news is that from December the 12th, we'll also have the chance of getting back into Dean Court and watching live football. We absolutely cannot wait. In terms of the podcast, we'll be back from next week to our audio only releases. So whilst you'll be able to view the second look video on our YouTube channel, which is the match dissection part, the whole pod will be exclusively available on your podcast app. And next weekend, given it's a Friday night game, I'm sure we'll bring it out earlier than usual. So keep your eyes open for that. So let's bring in our team for today. And it's a face I see online all too regularly, Tom Jordan. Tom, how are I you? That. I can't believe that was me. Got it. Uh, yeah, I'm all right, Sam. Yeah, all good. Cheers. We've also got uh, Mr. Tiggs with us as well. Tiggsy, how you doing? Yeah, I'm good, buddy. I'm not too bad. I don't, I don't get online enough. That's the thing. I don't... I agree know, with that. A... <laughs> <laughs> and also we've got uh, Neil Dawson here as well. Neil, how's it going? Very good, Sam. Very good. I'm just hoping to get Tom's autograph at the end. <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure that can be arranged. So coming up in today's show, we'll dissect the two-all draw at the New York Stadium against the Millers. We'll look forward to Tuesday's clash at home versus Preston. Plus, we'll also catch up with a little bit of social media news over the weekend as well, including some great news on those cherries kits that finally reached Uganda. But first, it's time for this. So it's time for Do You Remember Again? And this week, we're going to put it to the panel and hopefully they, after the show, well, just before it ends, will be able to help me out with the answer. Now, we've got a question regarding a player that has played for both the Cherries and the Millers. No, it's not the Ginger Zidane or the Welsh Zidane, Sean McDonald, as you might be thinking. It's actually Lee Camp, who was goalkeeper for Rotherham for two seasons in 2015. Of course, we know that he was part of the campaign in 2014-15, which led us to promotion to the Premier League. But the question today is, can you name all of the clubs that Lee Camp has previously signed for that currently play in the championship. That includes loan or permanent signings. So all of the clubs that Lee Camp has previously signed for that are currently in the championship. Have a think and we'll give you the answer at the end of the show. Hi, I'm Michael Botto making some noise for the boys on Back of the Net. So on Saturday and start spreading the news, we left the New York Stadium yesterday with a point after another JT change paid instant dividends with an equaliser against the Millers. But it was a frustrating performance on the whole against Rotherham. We don't always win every game we play, of course, but you can't help but feel that we were the architects of our own demise yesterday. Rotherham was strong. They were physical. And they got in our faces early doors. It was an obvious tactic, which is often used to negate footballing sides. But niggles aside, the home side gave us a lesson in quality from wide. Great deliveries and a two-all draw was probably a fair result. I'll come to you first, Tom. How do you feel about that two-all? Yeah, it's a difficult one, really. I think it's on one end. I feel like it was a missed opportunity. Um, we're a better team than Rotherham. But... On the day, I felt they thoroughly deserved the point. Um, like you say, I thought they had a game plan. They executed it really well. 
I would like to think that it was similar to kind of Middlesbrough away and Sheffield Wednesday away, and we probably stood up to it a bit better than in them games, I would say. Having said that, their balls in the box, really, they still caused us a lot of problems. Um, I think it was Joe Matic, one it down the left, who was putting in some lovely balls that we were struggling to deal with. But when we went 2-1 down, I was glad we managed to show that character to get back in it and at least come away with a point. Wasn't ideal. We certainly missed Lewis Cook, Dan Juma, that bit of magic that's got us out of jail a few times, I would say, this season. So it was a frustrating one. But when we went behind, I would have taken the point and I was kind of happy to just get out of there, to be honest, because it wasn't it wasn't vintage, vintage us, was it? But um, yeah, I thought credit to Rotherham. I thought their game plan worked to perfection, mm. to be honest with you. Neil, what were your thoughts on it? Yeah, I think we well, it's interesting because we've now entered a stage where we're playing teams closer to the bottom. I think there was an expectation amongst the fans that having played all the top teams, when we played the bottom teams, life would be easier. I'm not sure that'll come to fruition because I think what we'll see is um, we quite like playing against footballing sides. We saw that in the Premier League. We morphed into being a side um, from being a side that played better against the lower teams but could never take on the top six to the, to a side that could go toe-for-toe toe with the top six but then lost the ability to beat the more physical bottom teams as we, as we evolved the side. We've still got a lot of those players. So I think they quite like the games against um, Norwich uh, and teams like that because it feels like a Premier League game. Yesterday, um, it, you know, some of those players will never have, Rico will never have seen football like that in his life. I bet Rocco was looking at it from the bench thinking, don't bring me on because that was that was League One football. Um, so we, you know, we all know it. So I think as a side, we've had Middlesbrough and, and uh, Sheffield Wednesday to a degree and Rotherham now do it to us. We've, we've got to learn how we evolve to that and it'll be interesting. So when the teams came out at two o'clock, Mr Tiggs, it was Billing and Gosling who came in for Lewis Cook and Dan Juma and it looked like we were playing a 4-3-3. But the one thing that mm. struck me was both the youth and inexperience on the bench. I was thinking, please don't get injuries because it, it looked very form-like, didn't it? Yeah, it did. And when you're playing a game like Rotherham, that's not what you want to see on your bench, really. You know, that there wasn't... I mean, I, you can kind of understand the team selection in that respect. He's put... He's gone with the players he thinks he's going to compete the best in the middle of the field. Um, so, Goslin, we know that he can definitely do that. We know that Lerma can definitely do that. Uh, and we had Billing as well. So, um, I can understand that. It's just a shame that there wasn't anyone on the bench that we could have brought on who can, who can give us the same kind of, uh, what shall I say, fighting performance. Hmm. Yeah, and I wish we had the doggedness that you have there because that's what we yeah. needed yesterday. And little terrier, that's what we needed. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it's right. And you know, mate, and maybe uh, you know, Lewis Cook was that person. And uh, to, uh, Tom, I've got to say that um, you know, for the first few sort of well, for f first few minutes of the game, the, we showed sort of isolated promise. But we had Brooks that went on that early run about forty yards or so. But the final product was not particularly great. But Rotherham, they were they were counteracting us by being physical. They were inviting pressure, and they gained a number of free kicks early. And you could tell it was just going to be one of those niggly bitty games, couldn't it? Yeah, I think from early on you could you could see we we're going to have to grind this one out. We're not going to have, we're not going to beat them just by playing football because they're going to make it really difficult. Um, I thought they nullified uh, Brooksy really well. On that side as well, that was they were probably they were quite strong on that side. Like I mentioned, Matic earlier, and they put they 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 covered a lot of ground and made it really difficult. But like Tiggs alluded to there as well, you know, you're bringing in someone like Goslin, who yeah hasn't been playing for us recently, but that's the kind of game that that suits him. I mean, I suppose if if Lewis and, and Arnie have both got knocks after watching the game, I think well it doesn't surprise me that Jason didn't want to risk him for that one. Um, but having said that, Jeff in particular made a bad tackle as well. You know, we we had a few fouls as well. But yeah, I think. It was just one of them that you could see, like you say, from early on, it was going to be not a great watch. Uh, but having said that, I didn't expect it to be at all from early on. I thought we might have to try and grind a 1-0 out here. So um, that was still the disappointing aspect, was that we conceded two sloppy goals from a team that were just trying to disrupt us, really. And, yeah, it, it, did, it did hark of League One football, Neil, didn't it? Because they were really getting up in our grills and they were pressing quite high and sometimes we struggle and... With the, um, I didn't think the technical quality was there from us, and uh, we made it difficult for ourselves. Yeah, the thing that surprised me was that they carried it on all game. So I was watching it, thinking they're, you know, they're doing this really, really well, and the high press is is knackering. And we've seen other teams 
uh, do it to us. Coventry played a high press against us um, to begin with and then just ran out of steam. So I think if you were, you know, Rotherham fan, you'd be absolutely delighted because they kept that going for 90 minutes. Um, and I think we, it's interesting with, with the Go Gosling and Billing coming in because they're both players that I think need quite a bit of time on the ball. Billing because he looks like he's got the need time to work out what he's doing. Gosling because his first touch isn't always great. And so I think... It's interesting, both those players look more comfortable to me at a high level than they do in the in the championship. And Gosling, we saw, wasn't great with us in the championship the first time around, but was but was decent at times in the Premier League. So I just think they didn't have time to take a touch. They were on us, and it, it would be a less it's a lesson for us. And those games will be hard for us all season because we've got a very different team. There's no Elphix and Franos, people that roll their sleeves up. It's a very different team now. Do you think we lack leaders, Neil? No, no, I don't think that's a problem. I think Lewis Cook's captain England under twenty ones at World Cup level, wasn't he? Jefferson Lerma's a great leader as you could have. Steve Steve Cook's the best captain in the league. Um, you know, Smith shouts a lot. I don't I don't think I've heard I've read it, but I just don't agree. I think we've got some really good leaders. So on 15 minutes, uh, Bournemouth started to get a foothold in the game, and uh, Stanislas, it was a it was a turn very similar to in the week against Forest. It was a it was a Dan Juma esque turn on the uh, left flank, and he whipped in an early first time ball uh, low to Dom Solanke, who slid in, but the ball just eluded us. Um, the angle just didn't quite favour him really, but that's when it started to tick for us. It's almost like that movement gave us a little bit of confidence, and on 18 minutes. Dom was felled in the box and we were saying on one of the last shows we did that who's that player that's going to win us penalties and close control from Dom after Rotherham were up in ball with uh, your faces and he almost Robson carnooed it or if you remember when Liverpool beat Barcelona 4-0 Gigi Wijnaldum on about 86 minutes managed to do a turn a Cruyff turn and then take out two Barcelona players and it was a little bit like that maybe the comparisons a little bit generous for Dom Solanke, but he played it then out wide to Kelly and then that quick ball into the box. Dom got a foot on it. It was almost a miscontrol, but he managed to get um, control of it again. And then it was a it was a clash of feet, Tom, and some people saying it was soft penalty. Others say it wasn't a penalty. Others saying it was Stonewall. What was your opinion of it? I think it was a penalty, but I think you can still say it was a soft penalty. Um, I think it's one of them, really. If it's if it's for you, you're, you're screaming for a penalty there. If it was the other way around, I would have been gutted and said he barely touched him. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah, it's what it is. I think some refs would give it, some refs wouldn't. We got away with it, um, got got decision. But I think that was key in the, like you said, when we started um, we started getting a few little moves together. And it seemed to be coming more from Junior down that left-hand side um, rather than Brooksy, funnily enough. But um, they seemed to be nullifying Brooksy well. But Stanislas was popping up quite nicely on the left-hand side. Yeah, like you say, Don, good, good control. And when, I mean, I don't want to jinx it, but I've never been so confident with a penalty taker than, than I think that's seven from seven now, I think I heard someone say. But um, yeah, I mean, he just looks, and you almost know what he's going to do anyway. You know, he's just going to place it down the middle, but he seems to wait for the keeper really well. So I was I was confident and he, yeah, he took it really well. So um, I'm probably jinxed it now and he'll miss one next time. But uh, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm always happy when Junior's stepping up. Tiggs, it was one of those penalties. The keeper just didn't need to move whatsoever. Should have just stood no. where he was. And he just caught it, you know, in his midriff, in his chest. Uh, and like Tom says, I, you know, he's he has to be our first choice if he's on the pitch. I suppose the question is what happens when he isn't. But he he does have a great technique. He um he scored a great pen in the previous game as well. Uh, before that, and yeah, you know, never have I felt sort of confident. And at that point, you're wondering what are Bournemouth going to do. Are they going to push on? Are they going to try for a second? But after that, we, did, we didn't really see it, did we, Tiggs? I think it's a bit like uh, poking an angry bear with a stick. I just felt that, that from that point on, Rotherham really just, they came at us. I mean, they were pressing us hard before that. But after that point, um, I think, you know, if they could have broken our legs, they would have. It, it just it just changed the game for me from that point. They, they dominated us, I felt. Um, when you know when we had the ball, they just got it back. Um, we just couldn't get up the pitch, and it, yeah, a completely different game. It's odd that when goals are scored, you always expect it to to improve your chances, but for us, I felt it made it a lot harder. Yeah, and I think their delivery from out wide was superb. On twenty one minutes, there was a, a cracking save from Asmir, who's arguably 
been our player of the season, along with Lewis Cook, we could say. Really quick cross from Joe Matic and Kirk and a number of others have been saying the importance of having good, crisp, clean, whipped, you know, fast crosses, whereas quite often they hang in the air, ironically. We scored from a, a cross that hung in the air later on in the game, but alas, it was a great, a great cross. And then I think it was Jamie Lindsay who who arrived, and you know he didn't need to get much on it, but it was a cracking save for Asmir. But that that sort of set a precedent, and we knew what was coming when Joe Matic, uh, you know, had had the ball on the left flank. And <clears throat> what happens on thirty five minutes? Rotherham equalise. It was Matic who um, feeds Freddie Ladapo. A quick throw after Gosling cleared it. He cleared it for a throw. And then uh, it was a good finish past Begovic and Kelly was closest to him. Can you put any, you know, can you put any blame on anyone for that, Neil? I can't, but Jason will, that's for sure. So uh, it's difficult to know because we don't know how they were set up to defend. But he he arrived in a box with uh, three defenders. Um, uh, I think technically he was playing slightly wide. So it would either have been uh, Kelly or the centre back closest to Kelly, um, but I don't know. They, they will have been they will have been told, but certainly he he came through three defenders and side footed home. So um, there's no doubt that they'll look through that on video and they'll they'll there is blame somewhere, but I couldn't tell you which player it is. But the, but those those crosses were fantastic, and clearly it was a ploy because I mean Chris Temple lost I lost count of how many times he said we've not won a header. Uh, this game and and you know they they knew that 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 potentially a weakness for us is is that sort of physical defending of crosses and and they piled them in all game and fair play to them. It felt like we weren't being aggressive enough. To, Tom, do you think we are aggressive? <laughs> because for me, it doesn't feel like it sometimes. Yeah, I know what you mean. I think um, I agree. I agree with what Neil said. It was obviously someone's fault. It, it looked like Kenny was on his heels a bit, but we don't know who was supposed to be picking him up at that point. But I think, uh, like you say, Chris Temple was was mentioning that a lot. And I remember the first half of the Reading game, was it uh, Lucas Jow was their striker? And I felt right. like he was bullying us up there, that kind of physical presence. Yeah. Um, and that's, it, it's kind of, it's a strange one for me because I, I look at Cookie and I think he's, you know, solid wins headers. I think Mets come on in the second half against Reading and I thought he was dominant. He suddenly, he didn't lose a header. So um, that was strange to see. I don't, I don't know, you know, like like you say, Jason will have a look at that. But certainly something that I noticed in the first half against Reading was we struggled with a physical presence. And we certainly did again. I think going what, like Tiggs alluded to as well, getting that, it was always going to be a tough game. When we got that first goal, I really felt now we could, oh, we'll just, we'll kick on from that. And I wonder if the players almost thought that, oh, finally we've got the goal. And fair play to Rotherham. They deserve credit because um, they just, they kept coming. But um, yeah, it was, it was really disappointing to see us Almost not cave in, but almost really, really not find a way throughout the whole game to deal with that physical presence they had. So, um, fortunately, we got away with a point, and Jason will be able to look at that because it was it was evident, wasn't it? I was doing them a disservice on the free for all by saying that um, that's the only. I think it's frustration, but you know, I've seen them play football before, and they can play quite well. But they knew who they were playing, and they used their experience to get under the skin of us. And rather than out football us, which they can't, they tried to rile us, and it was threatening to boil over during the first half, wasn't it, Tiggs? Yeah, completely. I really did think there would be a card or two more than there were. I, I was expecting a red. Never saw it. There was one point where. Um, uh, Stanislas was was through on goal, and the tackle came in. And I, the angle wasn't great from the TV pictures, and I thought, ah, oh, you know, this this could be could have been through on goal there. It might be a red, but um, in fact, it was an incredible tackle um, from from their player. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's tricky. It's tricky to understand how we can combat teams like that. I think our transfer dealings have been the players that we've got are quite cultured. I think you know we've been trying to get players who can pass the ball around, but. Mm -hmm. I don't think aggression has been something that was on Eddie's tick list. I, I just don't. Apart from Lerma, but then, you know, uh, that's one, isn't it? That's, that's one. One mm -hmm. player out of the lot. So we had a uh, free kick just before half time that Stanislas uh, cheekily whipped over from 30 yards, but the keeper Blackman uh, scrambled across to save it. And yeah, we were starting to look better on the ball and it's a shame half time had to come really. But, you know, JT, if he's notorious for anything so far, it's... Uh, doing good team talks or, or whatever he does. And the team comes out a lot different in the second half, but didn't quite happen this time. Although we had a chance uh, where Brooks played the ball over the top to Junior, who cut in and, and shot. And, and it, I think the ball was scrambled clear, eluding Dan Gosling. About two minutes after that, Neil, 
Ladapo scored and it was a free kick conceded by Smith on the left flank and the ball was fired over and then it went over to the other flank and then they crossed it over and he was at the far post, managed to turn Smith and loop it in from an impossible angle, but it did look like it took a touch off Adam Smith, didn't it? It did. I saw their manager say if Dennis Bergkamp had done that, that people would have been talking about it for ages. <laughs> the, um, uh, I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced. I think that's good for the morale of his player to say that. Yeah. Um, but again, Smith with his little dangly leg for that. Uh, uh, going back to um, what you know, Tiggs was saying, mm. is it cultured or they just or is it pretty? We've got pretty pretty defenders now. Smith's a pretty defender. Mepham's very cultured and pretty. Um, you know, Kelly, Rico, they're, they're not, there's no Tommy Alphick in there or 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 Simon Francis. And I think we, you could see it with that goal because he went past Smith and Smith didn't re, didn't get close to him and then sort of dollied a little leg out. And mm. Whether or not it hit that leg or not, I don't know. But it was definitely across the far post. But, um, but yeah, that was it. 2-1 down. I wasn't sure whether we were going to get back into it, to be fair, because it was so stop-starty and it seemed like there were more, you know, referees' whistles than passes during the well, first half, especially, Tom. But it was a it was a really sort of niggly game. But thankfully, we did get into it and it was a change that was deployed by JT. Smith and Kelly came off. Rico and Surridge were on. And what did we do? Was it three at the back we went? Yeah, I think we went, from, went to a three, didn't we? Moved um, Stanislas kind of went into that right wing back slot, and uh, yeah, Rico come on to that left wing back slot, and I, I guess he just wanted the three centre halves for the for the directness of them, but also to give us get let wing backs bomb, bomb on and try and get balls in and get uh, Brooksy maybe a bit closer to a front two, and Dom obviously partnered with Surridge, but um, yeah, it was a it was a good change. I I did um, think maybe Surridge would get on just to get someone closer to Dom, but um, yeah, the Rico change was good. I think. Um, Kelly wasn't having much joy down that left side. So, and you know, Rico has got a delivery on him. And I think it's um, easy to forget. Rico's been quite consistent, barring one horrendous 45 minutes against Reading. So I was quite happy to see him come on and obviously ended up getting the assist as well with a, with a little dinked ball in this time. So, and obviously Dom, goal machine. So no problem. <laughs> Dom, the goal machine. And Tiggs, you were uh, sort of alluding to the fact earlier, although without having said it, that maybe Philip Billing didn't have the best of first halves, but I'll tell you what, he was he was instrumental in that in that uh, second goal for us, wasn't he? Yeah, he was. I mean... It... <laughs> <laughs> I feel I like mean, there's a butt coming. Well, I mean, he was, but he, right place, right time. I don't I don't really know if... I don't want to take it... I don't want, I'm not taking it away from him, but at the same time, I think <laughs> any player... I think Begovic could have been in that position and, and the same result <laughs> would have happened. So, you know, that's... I, he puzzles me because I can see, we can all see how, how good a football is. But what's really interesting for me is that Tindall started playing Cook deeper this season and he played Lerma more advanced. We all know what Gosling can do. I just don't know where where he should be on the pitch. I just don't know. Should Billing be further up and maybe be pressing higher? I mean, that might work for him. I don't know. It's tricky. Yeah, it is. Uh and you know what, from going two all, thought we'd push on and it, it looked like Rotherham had pulled one back, but thankfully it was a it was offside. It was a scissor kick from McDonald, I think, and then the follow-up. A great save by Beggs, got to say, but then Crooks mm. uh was flagged offside. And you know, Neil, throughout the game, you know, Begovic showed a lot of class and uh you know, we've we've spoken about it so many times. He's like a new signing, isn't he? Yeah. He is. I mean, we talked about it on the last time that his pedigree should never be questioned by anyone, whether or not we saw it in that season. He's, he's, he's an outstanding international goalkeeper and we're seeing it now. Um, it's interesting because everyone raved about that scissor kick save and rightly so. But I thought the save he made in the first half was harder for a keeper to make because he was going to cross goal and he just got his fingertips to that guy's volley at the near post that you talked about earlier, Sam. That to me was a harder save to make, but they were both saves that most keepers wouldn't make. Um, uh, outside of international keepers, F phenomenal and um, long may it continue. He's he's probably now the one player we'd worry about getting injured. And if you'd said that to me in August or September, whenever this bloody season started, I would have uh, I would never have believed you'd have said that. <clears throat> yeah, that's right. And then uh, I thought I thought that we were going to um, I thought we were going to win it three two. Stanislas, uh, I think uh, either the ball got fed out to Rico, and then he cut the ball back to Philip Billing, who who blasted over from the angle, and you know probably should have done better with it, given that there were players in the box. But 
whenever Rotherham got set pieces, either after that or before that, I was always worried, weren't you, Tix? Because they, you know, their delivery was just so good. And I don't know, there's there was a vulnerability yesterday that I haven't really seen in previous games. And I, I don't quite know why that was. I just think that Rotherham knew where that ball was going to go. And I, you know, they, they, every time they gambled, they won every header they and then they won the second ball they, they, they know exactly where that ball is going to go every time a free kick comes in i don't think we can say the same if i'm honest with you i you know our um our free kicks and our set plays all together last season was, was something that people kept going on about how great they were but I, I don't think we really know this season there's a few that we've had where you know the ball's definitely not gone where it was supposed to and i don't think rather have that problem yeah, and then in uh, 90 minutes, uh, across from the left-hand side, Surridge couldn't quite get a, get a good enough contact on it. It was a, a great chance for Bournemouth. But 2 all, thankfully, due to the Norwich result, uh, we still stay in second. It feels a little bit fortuitous, Tom, really. But uh, I'm in two minds about that. You know, if you win all your matches at home and draw away, it's not so bad. But I don't know, when you're playing teams, at, uh, this sounds condescending, of a particular level, then you expect that you should be able to pick up three points. But it was just one of those games, wasn't it? Yeah, it's difficult. I think um, Neil said it earlier, I think we probably are going to have to find a way to combat that because I think we're, we look better against teams that try and play football um, because it's harder. Team, teams are going to come out and, and sit back and just make it nasty and make it horrible. I wonder if there was a uh, an element of surprise to a degree. I, I've not seen that much physicality from Rotherham in previous games and maybe they... You know, use that just specifically for playing us, and maybe that caught us by surprise a little bit. But um, yeah, I think it's it's almost a silly comparison to make. But obviously, Man City smashed Burnley at the weekend, and Man City are a team who have got a lot of um, neat and tidy footballers, but no one that really wants to get into a fight. But they've got a good plan A, and they executed it on the day. But occasionally, they get bullied out of games. If we we've got players that we know what they could do, and unfortunately, they didn't quite have it to their left. If Brooksy was on it like he was the previous game, we probably would have won that game, for example. You know, I don't, I don't think um, in footballing terms, we weren't good enough on the ball either. I know it's easy to look at the sense that we were probably physically bullied a little bit. But if we if we were to our levels on the ball, I still think we would have had enough to win the game. So um, we weren't quite on it. And uh, hopefully, but hopefully that's a bit of a learning curve as well for the way they were. And we didn't lose it. So yeah, difficult one because yeah, Norwich, it looked nice, but then also it's a missed opportunity to go top in it. So um Difficult one, but I was happy to get out of there with a point, to be honest. Something that's uh, worthy of note is that 12 years ago, Bournemouth, Rotherham and Luton were in the bottom tier of English football. Right. In that time, of course, Cherries have spent five seasons in the top flight and Luton have been in the relative wilderness of non-league football. But Rotherham, well, they've sort of flitted about the divisions, had landlord disputes, and now they're back. They've been in about three different stadiums. It's the first time... All three clubs with the deductions have actually played in the same division. So credit to uh, all the sides and F the EFL. I'm absolutely certain we all agree with that. Right then, let's get some Cherries news. Hi, I'm Dan Goslin and you're listening to Back of the Net. So then, at this point, we thought we would give you the preview of the second game a little bit later on. But here's some Cherries news in the meantime, because the first story comes courtesy of Steve Butler, who put out a tweet yesterday regarding the AFC Bournemouth Academy in Uganda. And it was absolutely superb to see. Anyone watching on uh, YouTube will be able to see this tweet at home. And look at those lads all wearing the Bournemouth shirt. Absolutely superb. So this was something that we mentioned on a previous pod, as lots of money has been raised through a GoFundMe page, plus, plus with lots of help from the club, including Steve Cook, the Iban Primary School, which is in Bujembe in Jinja, Uganda. It's a community-based orphanage and football academy. The headmaster is Mr. Moanda Albert, and formed by Coach Kizza Joshua, who's a long-time Bournemouth and die-hard fan. The fundraising platform was created via Steve Butler to purchase initially uh, a load of football shirts, boots, shorts, socks, baseball caps, uh, caps etc. for 
Coach Kizza and the boys and girls teams. And as you can see by those uh, photos there, they all look fantastic in their tops there. There's some there's some training kits as well. They've all got uh, smiling faces. And look at that. That kit on the right, that reminds me of that Tekelo Ranty 30-yard screamer <laughs> uh, against Burnley. Although that, that may have been in a white kit, I, I'm not too sure. But, you know, whenever I see certain kits... I always think of certain players, but Tom, fantastic new story. Credit to Steve Butler, and um, it's a you know it's a really good pick me up after that two all draw. If anyone was disappointed to see their smiling faces on Twitter this morning, absolutely brilliant, isn't it? Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, big up to Steve Butler, absolutely incredible, and yeah, Cookie and all the players and the the club getting involved is just amazing. But um, yeah, things like that just bring a smile to your face, don't they? Especially in these times. So um, yeah, brilliant to see and. Yeah, I've, I've always had a soft spot for that kit as well. It's not... Oh, what year was it then? I'm trying to think what year that kit was. Um, it's not that that old, is it? Well, it's, it's Energy uh, Consulting, so the sponsorship yeah. might, might... I've always liked that blue. 2014, was it? Yeah, I wonder if it was... Was it first mm. championship season? Yeah, that yeah, might be a shower, I think. But yeah, I've always liked that one, the, the dark and light blue kind of combined. It's a nice kit, so uh, yeah, that's, that's great to see. Yeah, it really is, Tiggs, isn't it? And uh, whilst you, um, you know, talk about the positive community that AFC Bournemouth have got, because we well, have, haven't they? With, with you know, talking uh, cherries, proud cherries, etc., and all the different fundraising initiatives, um, it's a really good feel-good story, isn't it? Yeah, it's amazing. Well, you know, we're really, really lucky. I think the Premier League has brought so much attention on us, and it's so pleasing to see that we can use that attention for, for good now. You know. Um, we're building a lovely reputation as a club that, that that cares. And when I say a club, I don't mean the people that, that necessarily work there, but all of us, the fans and, and the community around the club. Yeah, look at that. That's an amazing little bit of video, isn't it? Nice. Number three. I was a cookie fan, obviously. Yeah, I do know. I just think it's absolutely superb. So, yeah, credit to uh, Steve Butler for that. Absolutely brilliant work. And, uh, yeah, we'll post the link below to uh, Steve Butler so you can keep abreast of what is going on with regards to that. Because, uh, yeah, absolutely superb work. Well done, Steve Butler. This is Matt Holland and you're listening to Back of the Net. Now, also, uh, just a passing point of interest is the non-story that became a story this morning, something which came from the bastion of credible journalism that is The Sun, uh, a publication that most people probably wouldn't wipe their backside with. But um, it was all about a certain purchase made by a chief executive. And, you know, The Sun creates stories for people to be talking about it, whether rightly or wrongly. And like a moth to the flame, we all did. And, uh, Neil, I mean... <laughs> What did you make of what you saw this morning? Um, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, it depends. There's so many stories within a story, so it depends which one you want to pick, isn't it? So, uh, I mean, personally, what someone chooses to do with their own money is up to them. So, you know, if he wants to buy his wife, a, if he wants to buy his wife a John Paul Gaultier hot air balloon, it's up to him. It doesn't. It doesn't affect the rest of us. It's his money. I think the the bit that attracted me to the story was more having been someone that sort of collected money for the club before. And, shoved 10 peas in buckets, uh, having witnessed when we overspent on our way back down before, it just really concerned me the level of salary uh, that a, that a non-playing or non-managerial member of the team is getting. So, I mean, there's reports in that stats that you sent over, Sam, that he's getting close to 2 million quid. Now, whether or not that's true, I don't know. But if you're buying that sort of car, it probably is. So I just question, you know, with people being laid off by the club um, and... Uh, us not signing any players in the summer and us tightening the belt. You know, do we need a chief executive on two million quid? Because I know a lot of FTSE 250 company chief execs that do a brilliant job for a fifth of that level who have been chief executives before. Because Neil Blake obviously got the job because he was Eddie Mitchell's son in law, not because he was an experienced businessman. So that was my take on it. Okay, Tom. Yeah, no, I, I, I like the Bentley. Nice, one. <laughs> Very nice. Um, no, I, I mean, to, to be honest with you, I agree, agree with what Neil said, you know, if he wants to spend his money however he wants to spend his money. I think it is a, it's one of them things that's going to, um, I don't know what the word is, but when you see, like like Neil said, you know, fans have put a lot of money into into the football club over the years. We've seen us getting problems financially. Sometimes it's like, yeah, we probably know he's on a lot of money. I'd rather not know officially, though, do you know what I mean? I'd rather just think he probably is, but I don't want to know about it. Um, because, yeah, like you say, we haven't signed any players. Um, people have taken 
take a pay cut. So I believe he took a pay cut as well. I don't. I'm not going to act like I know too much. Um, but yeah, people lost their jobs. So it's it's not a really nice thing to see. But to be honest, yeah, I think it's a bit of a non-story. Not sure how it got out or whether you know, like I say, it was um, the sudden report with the players aren't happy and things like that. I can't pretend to know. But um, yeah, I, I just looked at it and thought. Oh, it's a bit. I, I wish that didn't come out, but it's not going to bother me too much. Quite like the car. She looked happy with it anyway, so let's move on. Yeah. I, did, I did think, looking at the height of her, that a better use of her might have been uh, against Rotherham for the last 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> She's played just as much as Carter Vickers. <laughs> yeah, no, very, very much so. I mean, you know, it all depends what you see it, you regard as a measure of success. Is it the team's position? You know, is it... You know, if that's not successful and the fact we're playing EFL football, does that mean that Eddie is a failure too now? I mean, uh, you know, I would guess that the transfer monies and the club's financial state is probably the only gauge. But from what Cherry's Trust have told us, we're we're in a healthy position. Yeah, we've had no signings, but there is a training ground still pending. The team are a point off the top of the table. And um, with what, what some people say is a manager not good enough for the job and, you know, despite Neil Blake being you know, good enough for Eddie for for a long period of time. At the same time, Max, I think, also is trying to recoup some of his nine-figure sum that he's putting. It's, it's funny we only question the wage that he earns when there's something flashy to look at. I mean, we want everyone to be an Eddie with regards to his media persona, but, you know, not everyone are. I think that at worst, maybe you call it insensitive, but then, you know, so are all the other Instagrammers who are flashing you know, cash on their channels. I think you've got two parts to it. You've got the sort of, you've got the immorality, um, in my mind, like the money accrued during the Premier League era, uh, you know, for his wage, it's, you know, surely his business. Um, he he was responsible for, um, you know, overseeing, like thieves in the night, the transfers of Mings and Mousset. Uh We were almost, you know, clad with balaclavas, Tom, weren't we, with the amount of money that we got for those two? None of which we, you know, we didn't know how much we'd get for them. But to get what we did, it was just like, what the hell? He's, he's pulled off a coupe there. Yeah, no, definitely. And obviously, like I say, it's, it's just one of them things. I, I would like to think that everyone's been rewarded for the journey we've had and the promotion and how we've done. But also, yeah, and everyone's probably lost some money in terms of pay cut stuff for getting relegated. And that's how that's how it should be. Um, regards to his job role and whether he's worthy of how much he reportedly gets paid or whatever. It's not I, I don't know enough about his job role. Do you know what I mean? I don't I wouldn't be able to tell you what other people in his job role get paid. Um and obviously he was he was at an elite football club in terms of we we're in the Premier League. But um yeah, it's one of them. It's it's, it's one of them things you just rather not see, uh, we on the back of just a relegation and and like you say, knowing that people have lost their jobs and things like that. But um all all I do know is Eddie always spoke quite highly of him, didn't he, when we were talking about different transfer dealings and stuff like that. But um equally, like Neil pointed out, he he potentially looked like he, he got the job through a bit of fortune to who he was um, linked with rather than being amazing at the job. So but I honestly am not I don't know enough to be able to comment on it. Like I say, main thing I took from it was I quite like the car. <laughs> yeah, it was a it was a really nice car. And you know what? It's a, you know, it's a it's a familiar blueprint, really, isn't it? The um, the story which creates outrage and uh, you know show luxury item and then follow up with all the negatives that make it look inappropriate, like relegation, furlough, pandemic, etc. But you know, like either way, um, it's yeah, it's been an interesting sort of weekend on social media. So we thought we would just mention that as well. Yes, Morgan, I'm trying to make a joke that was regards to something else, which uh, I stupidly flashed up on screen. But either way, next, we're talking football, thankfully, and it's Preston North End. Hi, this is The Big Un, Steve Fletcher, and you're listening to Back of the Net. So on Tuesday night, live with multiple cameras and replays on AFCB TV, or you got the single camera option on the Sky Sports Red button. Cherries entertain Preston North End. Now, the last time we played them was in September 2006, and I, I remember walking home in absolute disgust. I, I, I recorded a podcast about it after the ticketing shambles. I was trying to collect a ticket. I arrived nice and early, didn't even manage to get anywhere near the collection point because of the mass queues out Outside. I think only three windows were open. In the end, I was delighted to miss it as Bournemouth lost 3-2 after a less than dire performance at Dean Court. Now, before we hear the thoughts of the boys on this one earlier today, we caught up with lead writer for Football Accumulators and Preston fan Jack Goodwin. It's too simple to say that we've just been really poor at home and we've been good away because at one point we were 
bottom of the home table, which I think we still are. And at one point, we were <laughs> top of the away table. Um, but I think it's it's too too simple to say that. I think it's the, the calibre of teams we've come up against and the style of play that they play, um, especially at home. I mean, we've played the likes of Birmingham, Sheffield Wednesday, Stoke, uh, Millwall. And you know yourself, these are all teams that are quite aggressive, get in your face um, yeah. sort of teams. Or, and, and if they get the first goal, they will sit back and yeah. invite us to have the ball. And throughout Alex Neal's three and a half years with North End, we've not been brilliant on the ball. We're a team that are better in transition, that hit teams on their counter-attack. And uh, we, we perform better against the likes of uh, Reading and Brentford, who like to keep hold of the ball. And then we just hit them by surprise when we wait for them to make a mistake, hit them by surprise, hit them on the counter-attack. And hopefully we put it away. But I mean, it's a championship, isn't it? It's it's, yeah. it's the beauty of the league. You can go and beat Brentford, who I think is one of the best teams. If not, I thought they were the best team in the league last year. I thought they were unlucky not to go up. But on the other hand, you could go to Rotherham, who probably, without offending them, they probably will go down or will be in the relegation scrap, but lose comfortably to them. So, yeah, it's, it's just the championship, isn't it? So there we are. Preston on Tuesday. Tiggs, how are you feeling about this one? Yeah, uh, hmm. tricky. I mean, they've they've shipped seven goals in the last couple of games, um, and we were talking earlier about what what the Rotherham manager said um, after his game, and the, the the manager of Preston said after after the weekend's game, um, he said, uh, "Give me Troy Deeney and, Al- and Andre Gray, and let's see how the game goes." So I think we're going to get a similar kind of response after our game i think it, it, there's there's certain um sort of vetimely feeling there that when you're playing against a team that's just come down from the premier league he doesn't much like it um so in his eyes already he's saying to me that we should be beating them but let's hope his players think that too neil it's gonna to be tough for them they come off the back of watford and then into bournemouth that's a lot of Two games where they where they'll do more chasing than they will have possession, particularly after what um, the Preston fans just said. It sounds like they do that anyway. So that's that's a lot to put into your legs. Um, two long road trips and a lot of chasing the ball around. Um, so I, I mean, to me, this this should be a comfortable win. Be good to see Jaden Stockley again. Hopefully, he'll get some minutes. Um, uh, I think he came on yesterday, so I don't think he's a starter. He was a a, a guy that. Tour League two apart, struggled a bit in the championship, probably finding out he's a League One striker, aren't we? So hmm. it'd be lovely to see him again. Yeah. And uh, Tom, it was the ex Norwich manager that's in charge of him, isn't it? Alex Neil, isn't it? Yeah. Not a fan of him. No. I don't like it. He's irritating, isn't he? But um, yeah. yeah, I don't know too much about uh, Preston, really. Like you say, they seem to have had a few bad results. And then I think they beat Reading 3 0, and I think they got four against Brentford. So they seem a bit. Like most teams of the championship, to be honest, consistently inconsistent. Do you know what I mean? I don't. I'm not sure what to make of them. Uh, Jaden, whether he starts or not, yeah, it'd be good to see him. I think the last few they've gone with a three at the back. Um, if they watch the watch the tape of uh, our game that we've just had, they'll certainly be trying to rough us up a little bit. And um, I think a lot of teams will be looking to try and do that now. We can't we we can't use the element of surprise now. Teams are going to look at what Rotherham did and said, Bournemouth have got technically good players. This is a way to get them because Rotherham are very close to winning if it weren't for some Begovic saves. Um, but also, Sam, you're probably alluding to the league, but I, I'm not letting you go with it. I did go to Preston not that long ago in the Cup because Federici was the hero in a shootout. Um, oh, yeah. I, I remember going because it was a Tuesday night and it went to blending penalties and I didn't even go to sleep before work the next day. The, the, how long it took me to get back on the coach. But yeah, I, just, I can't remember what the score was was in the game, but we... Um, we definitely went there. I definitely went there with Federici. So it would have been our first Premier League season in the cup. I think we beat Hartlepool the round before. I'm going to have to look uh, this up now, mate, because I can't remember. I and I was going to say as well, I'm sure we played them again at home. Yeah, that's the one that I was referring to. Yeah, we did to, in I the Carling Cup. Was that when that lad got a hat-trick? Um, yeah. He never scored again for him. Yeah, yeah. Mackinock, Mackinock. Yeah, but no, I definitely went to Preston because I remember I didn't sleep. So I was just just letting you know, Sam. But it was <laughs> yeah. cup, so I'm letting. It was, it was another cup one, so I'll let you. Off. I just, yeah, you know, if your team has just been smashed four one at Watford, Tiggs, 
they're going to do something different, aren't they, against a Bournemouth side that play equally open and expansive football? I just, I just fear that they're going to be watching that Rotherham game and also and thinking that's the blueprint that we need to do. You know, get up in their faces, be physical, be aggressive. It could be a, it could be a real tough one. It could be, but if if that's not the way that they're used to playing, if that's not what they they have done previously, then there's no guarantee they'll be any good at it. Mm. You know, I think the thing is we rely on playing our game. Um, I don't think this season we're going to have a, a different way of playing. We just need to defend against those balls that come in. We need to be better at, at closing down. I think um, you know their, their, their fullbacks or their wingers, wherever they they choose to be. But um, no, I, I'm still confident. I don't think I don't think that people can look at the game against Rotherham and think that um, we're a pushover. They certainly won't. You know they can try and play that way, but we've got our we've got our ways of of beating them. I think. Bloody hope so. Can we have uh, predictions all the way around in a minute? But Neil, you're just about to say something. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, I think a lot of it, how bad are the injuries to Cook and Dan Juma? Because if, mm. I, I mean, I didn't, I, I didn't, I'm, I can be quite critical of the side. I didn't actually think we were that bad yesterday, um, uh, surprisingly, because everyone else seemed to a little bit on social media. Mm. But it, we, so the key to the last three games prior to that was that Lewis Cook and Jefferson Lerma were outstanding together and Stanislas sat just in front of them. That three in the centre of midfield did everything for us. And then we took two of those players away yesterday, um, which disrupted the whole of the centre of midfield. And Billing and Gosling, you know, it may well be that they just weren't very good, but it may it may just well be that they don't have many games, so they haven't had a chance to get into a rhythm. The So, you know, that, that was quite critical to that performance. So if they're back for Preston, that makes a huge difference. Yeah, I agree mm. with Neil as well, because I think that Lewis obviously had some sort of knock, so he had to come out. Mm. But I felt it was strange to then move Stanislas out because he'd been doing so well in front. You know, yeah. I, would, I would have expected more, say, someone like a Raquel May instead of Billing, just to keep Stanislas in there because it had been, you know, he'd, he'd just come off the back and scored a couple of goals. But he was also, he looked really good in there. And it se- that seemed a bit strange. I mean, the Lewis one, if he's injured, he's injured. But um, yeah, that, that was a surprise because, like Neil said, that's that's changing two from that midfield area. But um yeah, I think the fact is as well. If they come and rough us up, we sh- the players we've got available, our plan A should still be good enough to be able to. Do- like I say, I think if we execute our plan A in the way we play well enough, we we should be able to get past that physical side of things. But um, just just something to look at. But Jason will be aware of it surely now. So I expect them to try and try and put that on us anyway. If Raquel, you know, had start, if Raquel me had started yesterday, he'd have been on the he'd have been on the plane home. True, we'd have been, face, we'd have been FaceTiming him, and he'd have been like, "No, it's okay. I, I stay here. I stay." Here. <laughs> <laughs> going up playing in going up playing in the Madrid academy, and then stood in Rotherham while some six foot eight bloke from Barnsley kicked you up the arse. I think he'd, have, he'd have been straight on the easy jet to Madrid. It takes what you got to say. I do. I do wonder sometimes. I wondered this under how whether there is a there is a pecking order. So two players get injured, and then the next two in the in the pecking order go in, as opposed to us changing, trying to change like for like. So I do, and I've seen this Tyndall before. I think that he he has. I feel that he has changed system to suit the players who are next in the pecking order. So you know when we had a you know a lot of defenders at the top of that pecking order, he was playing three at the back. You know, I I just wonder if. Um, Raquel May, it could have been a chance. Raquel May, you're right. You know, he probably would have got kicked to bits, but somebody out on the wing would have made more sense because that worked previously to keep Stanislas where he was. But there's a pecking order, and I think that you know, next on the pecking order was Billing, who hasn't had he hasn't even been on bench. He's been crying out for minutes. And Gosling, that's how I feel it went. I pick up on Tiggs's point a little bit. It's a good point because. Um... I think to be fair to him, because we we changed that three almost because he was forced because Steve Cook got suspended. Mm. But to his credit, when Cook was back, he continued with the with the four to his yeah. credit. But it's like Rico's being punished for a bad forty five because he needs to play Kelly, but he knows that Mepham and Cook is the better partnership. Because I personally, if they're all fit, I think Kelly would miss out for me. But mm-hmm. we would probably all agree at the start of the season, Kelly's probably the best of our defenders. But yeah. to, for a balanced side of it, I think that Rico's better as a left back, but Mepham and Cook probably is the best partnership. So interesting point Tiggs makes because um, I thought that as well. I thought it's almost like he's playing Kelly at left back because he thinks, oh, I've got to play the four now, but Kelly's too good to leave out. So that would be an interesting one because um, Kelly did go down in, uh, at one point in the game with a bit of a knock. So I wonder if he'll use that to maybe... I can see Rico 
replacing Kelly on, on Tuesday night, personally. Um, and then we'll see if Dan Juma and Lewis are, are ready to start or not. He's it's been very to... disappointing at left back, hasn't he, Kelly? Yeah. Um, so we've got we've had that thing where both Kelly and Rico looked excellent at the back of a three at left back, and neither of them, neither of them looked that good when they've had to play a, a proper in the orthodox left back position, which is really odd um, because both. I mean, Kelly played there for Bristol City. It was Eddie that saw centre half in him, and Rico's been a left back all his life. But they both. both it's almost like having a battle to not be in the team because whoever comes in. I mean. Rico, get, I think Rico gets unjustifiable stick. I think you called it spot on, Tom. He's had one bad 45 minutes this season. He had quite a few last year, but he's only had one bad this this time. But I just think he um, he 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 should start definitely if it, if it's a if it's at left back. And had had he played in the last two games like Kelly had, there'd be people on yeah. social media asking for him never to play again. Yeah, that's a reality. So. Hmm. It's so, weird as well, isn't it? Because I watched a bit of the sorry, Sam. I watched a bit of the England under twenty ones on the international break. Kelly played at left back in what I can't remember mm. which game it was, and he was brilliant. I mean, I know the opposition is different and stuff like that, but it is a strange one because, and it almost makes me think I can see why maybe we started the season with Smith there because Kelly yeah. and Rico haven't. But I say same what Neil said. I, I don't think I think what he had he had one of them games didn't he as a as a fullback against Reading. But apart from that. Um, I think I think Rico's been been pretty good apart from that. Um, and yeah, they both look quite quite decent as left centre back of a three. It is a weird one, but I think Kelly's had, had the last two games and he's performed n- no better than average for me. So I think it's time to to give Rico another shot in there. To be honest, but but I like the Mepham. I've always thought Steve Cook looks better left centre of a centre back. I don't know why uh, because he's right footed. But I remember when he was with Elphick, he was left centre back. And then when we went to the Premier League and he played with Distan for a bit, he got dropped. And when he was with Ake, I never thought he looked as comfortable. And I don't know why, but I like Cook left centre back. So I, I think that's the way to go. But it would be interesting to see. But Kelly's still a good player. But like Neil said, if Rico played like Kelly has last couple, we'd be getting pelters. So as James just said then, if you are going to play Kelly, preferred at left back or centre back, Tom? To be honest, right now, I don't play him either. If I, I think he's... I think over the I, I see that he's played um, for Bristol City there well and like I say for England. But for what I've seen for him is two games for Bournemouth at left back. Not for me. I would I, I see him more as a centre half to be honest. But he probably suits left centre back of a three the most. Not that I want to see that system, but he yeah. probably suits that the most. Mm-hmm. Brilliant. Okay, so let's just do a few predictions then, as we do. I'm going to go for a two 0 letter Bournemouth on Tuesday night. Tom, uh, I'll go two one. Uh, Dom Solanke brace beautiful Tiggs I'll uh, go 3-0 and I think we're going to see uh, Dan Juma back and he's going to get he's going to get two brilliant Neil I'll split the difference because I think it's going to be 3-1 um, and I think we'll concede a header uh, I do think Dom Solanke will score I think he's been excellent the last few games only fair to point that out because I was critical of him last year um, and he's on that he's on that run of form um, where he's becoming a right handful. So I think he'll be in the goal scorers. This is Mark Pugh, the foodie footballer, and you're listening to Back of the Net. And congratulations to Mark Pugh, who uh, he assisted Shrewsbury's winner today in the FA Cup against Oxford City as they won one nil in extra time. What a legend, Pewy, top man! Right, so uh, that nearly wraps it up on back of the net for this week. It's been a lively one. I've got to say, I've really enjoyed it. Um, nothing like a bit of stimulating cherries chat on a Sunday night. Thanks to everyone who's been watching online, and make sure if you're watching on YouTube to give this video uh, a like and subscribe to the channel as well. And to all those who are listening on your app. We'd really appreciate it if you leave a review on your podcast app. We'd thoroughly appreciate it. Plus, if you want to show your support financially, uh, you can buy us a coffee coffee and help to (laughs) deliver a better pod. Your support's really appreciated. It's afcbpodcast.com slash coffee. Looking to get some proper mics and hopefully soon we'll be able to do these kind of recordings all together sat with a pint round a table and do it the proper way we don't really want to be doing this streaming thing forever and uh we'll see how it goes with regards to when we can all back yeah get back together but of course at the football we can for the match on december the 12th so we are really looking forward to that now at the start of the show 
was do you remember where we asked can you name all of the clubs that mm. lee camp has previously signed for that are currently in the championship that includes loan or permanent signing so lads um should we go around one by one and see if we can name you know tick some off tom i'll, I'll let you start with one i mean you do could we, go for the obvious but do we just you. are we going round in one or do you want me to have yeah. a crack um, um, yeah just I'll do go, one by one uh not in a forest Forest, correct. Tiggs? Did he play for um, Coffer Coffee, Coffer Coventry? Coventry? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, easy for you to say. Yeah, Coventry. Yeah, he he. So he hasn't played for them yet, but he signed for them. But that yeah. is one of those clubs he signed for. So, yeah, Neil. He definitely played for Derby because yeah. there was that. Uh, I can't remember whether it was Derby or Forest fans singing all the time "Daddy's Boy" at him when. He played when we played against one of them because he, his father was his agent and brokered him a move between bit rivals for about an extra grand a week. So there was one set of fans that sang "Daddy's Boy" in the whole game. Tom, you probably remember better than me who it was. Yeah, I can't remember which way it was, but that that was great. And I think I heard something about his dad also rang up a radio station, almost like saying, yeah. "Oh, people need to get off his back. He's playing yeah. really well at the moment." Yeah. When, but then they found out it was his dad. It was brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. No um, way. That's hilarious. Yeah. Apparently. So definitely um, Derby. Yeah. Definitely yeah. Derby. Derby. Or, I'm. I'm gonna go for QPR. Uh, yeah. Because I remember that. So Tom will go. And with you've you. got him written down, probably. No, would I have? <laughs> no, but I, that is one that I do actually remember. But there, but there are some that I don't. So I think he was. Name. You said loans included, didn't you? Yeah. I think he was at Norwich on loan. Correct. He was. He was. Tiggs. I mean, four left. For, you could, you could go for the obvious one. I think he played for Cardiff, didn't he? Yes, he did. Oh, he bugger. That <laughs> yeah. Cardiff, <laughs> I, was, but, I thought Tom was going to say it. But, Neil, you, I mean, you could go for an, an obvious one based on this weekend's fixture. Hint. What, sorry, what? You mean Rotherham or Bournemouth, you mean? Or? Yeah. Well, or both. So, yeah, that's both. <laughs> um, Rotherham and Bournemouth covered. And, Tom, can you name I, the last one? I think club? I've got one more. Oh, oh, go, go on. on. Let, let him stab. Was it Huddersfield? No, oh. not Huddersfield. But it's a team that do play in blue. Is it Birmingham? Oh, Correct. Birmingham. Yeah. Birmingham. Yeah. There you go. So he's, I mean... He's, he's been at other clubs there. that are now not in the champ, but like... Yeah, well, who Sunderland, else? Um, Burton. He's, he's been everywhere, hasn't he? He has. West, West Brom? No. West Brom. West yeah, Brom, West yeah. Brom, yeah. He's um he's the epitome of a of a championship goalkeeper then so yeah Derby QPR Norwich Forest AFCB Rotherham Cardiff Brum and Coventry Lee Camp Bloody what hell. a lad and uh, yeah I think I think we worked out during that championship season he played thirteen matches for us in league and cup so he was a he was a significant part of it um right that just about wraps it up thank you so much guys really appreciate it Tom as ever thank you so much cheers sir. Tiggs appreciate it mate adios buddy. And Neil Dawson, thanks very much for coming on. Loved every minute. Good man, good man. And uh, I'm sure we'll see you again very soon. I certainly hope. So, yeah, on the YouTube channel, uh, an opposition chat is coming Monday. The free-for-all on Tuesday. Tom's player ratings on Wednesday. Uh, an opposition chat and a funnel flashback on Thursday. Super 6 update on the Friday. A free-for-all on the Friday. And much more over the weekend at all. Until then, stay safe. Savour that first pint with your dinner whenever you can go back to the pub and of course we'll be seeing you next time and coming up on the channel we have got three well two interviews with three former cherry stars matt tubbs josh mccoy and sean teal you've been watching and listening to back of the net the afc ball with podcast see you soon Oscar! 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 Oscar!